Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. This is Multifamily Chronicles, and I'm your host, Adrian Danila. This is episode number 24. My guest today is Jennifer Stachokas. Welcome to the show, Jennifer. Thank you so much. So happy to be here. Jennifer, you are the Executive Managing Director uh, for uh, Property Management at Western Wealth Capital. Please uh, share with the audience a little bit about yourself, about your background, and what you're currently doing. Sure, absolutely. So um, I'll start, I'll talk a little personal and I'll talk a little professional, but I grew up on the East Coast, uh, went to school in outside of Philadelphia and was a French major. Um, so clearly not utilizing my degree right now. I um, had the opportunity to study abroad in France for a year, uh, then went back to grad school for international business and had the opportunity to study abroad in England for a summer. And at that time is when I found a flyer in the elevator of the apartment building that I lived in outside of Washington, DC, that said, looking for fun, enthusiastic people uh, that wanna save money on their apartment. And I thought, wow, that sounds amazing. I'm going to grad school. I could really save some money on rent. So I went in and applied and uh, <clears throat> got hired on the spot as a leasing professional. So did that actually for a little bit of time and then got sucked into these, this industry like so many people do because I continued to get promoted. So I started in leasing, moved to a resident manager, uh, then actually got into my career of training, uh, became the training coordinator, the training manager, the training director, got into marketing, and then moved into corporate roles with Lincoln Property Company, with Pinnacle, which is now Cushman and Wakefield. Um, and held various positions that oversaw corporate marketing, property marketing, training, uh, revenue management, really anything that related to property performance. And then the opportunity came up with Western Wealth Capital, where they're an owner of properties and they were looking to bring property management in-house instead of using third-party providers. And so I was uh, really blessed to be able to be selected to build that property management company from scratch. Um, and have been doing that for a little over two years now. Something is very fascinating that you just said, building a management company from scratch. Uh, what are you know, some really great things to share about doing that? Uh, what, what does it feel like to actually build something? And by the way, first of all, uh, how many units are you currently, your company uh, is currently owning and managing? Yes, so we have, um, gosh, we have 59 properties today. It's a little over 15,000 units. Uh, we've actually onboarded, since we started the management company, 60 properties. We've disposed of one um, at this point. So over two years, we built a management company from scratch, and we onboarded 60 properties. Um, I jokingly say, but it's really not a joke, is that uh, we've been building the plane while we're flying it. So when you know, just to kind of, you know, reverse back, if you think about March of 2020, that's when I joined Western Wealth Capital. That's when the world locked down. It's when the world completely shut down and COVID hit. I had accepted this job, gosh, I guess in January, knowing I was going to be starting in March. And we thought that the world was going to be in a completely different place than it was. And so we not only were building a management company from scratch, we were doing it through COVID. So, you know, a lot of lessons learned, a lot of challenges that we faced because we didn't have the luxury of doing a lot of training in person, even though our offices were still open and we had built what I call COVID walls. So we could still interface with our customers. Um, we just didn't have that luxury of bringing large groups of people together for training. So we had to get really creative to onboard our properties, get the, get the properties up to speed and get the employees so they felt comfortable doing their day to day. Jennifer, would you like to share a few uh, instances, a few great lessons that you learn from building this amazing, uh, uh, amazing company? It, it's, it, it's, it's fascinating to me. I always wanted to be part of something like this and i have been throughout my career but to actually start like building it from scratch it, it's just amazing so uh, a few things that you know really you know you, you really like to share some extraordinary things about your journey sure i think you really have to think about think of the end in mind so where are you trying to get 
And now, you know, two years later, where I'm trying to get in another two years or five years is completely different than what I would have said in March of 2020. But really think about the end goal of what you're trying to accomplish. I would also say is that you don't want to bite off more than you can chew, right? Really looking at, so when I joined Western Wealth Capital and people heard we were building a management company, everybody wanted to be a part of that. So all of the supplier partners that I had worked with in the past, of course, wanted to be part of our growth. And they knew at some of the other large companies that I worked at, that I was a strong supporter and fan of their product. And it made sense in our business. But you really have to prioritize what are the things that I absolutely have to have to operate a company and operate a property? And what are the things that are on my wish list or that I would like to have? And really map that out. And that's exactly what we did. We documented what are the things that we needed to have so our residents could live in their apartments, they could pay their rent, we could do our books. And then what are those things that they would be really nice to have, that it would impact our business in a positive way, but I didn't need to have it at launch of the company. So again, you know, to summarize that, just prioritize everything and what is the end goal that you have in mind. I still have a couple of things on my list that I haven't been able to get to yet because other things have, you know, had a larger priority over those things that we have been able to accomplish. You're mainly on the West Coast and in Texas, if I'm, uh, if I'm not mistaken currently, right? For, for, those of you follow, uh, for those of us following your company, when should we expect Western Wealth coming on the East Coast? I'm an East Coast person. So I wanted to know when we're going to experience some uh, Western Wealth communities on the East Coast. Our goal is that hopefully by the end of this year that we will have some Western Wealth communities under management. So that's definitely the goal. Um, we're currently an owner in Atlanta, uh, but we don't manage those properties um, in-house at this point in time. Our markets that we do service are Houston, Dallas, Phoenix, Tucson, and Las Vegas. Um, but our acquisitions team is always looking for new markets, um, and East Coast is definitely on the radar. I'm, de I'm definitely looking forward to uh, see you guys grow your business mm -hmm. on the East Coast in my backyard, too. Absolutely. <clears throat> Jennifer, for someone with a stellar career like you had so far, uh, what, what are some great pieces of advice, some things that you know you would like to share with someone that's looking at you and say, wow, you know? A person this high up in a hierarchy, how did she get here? You know, what are the things that, you know, help you throughout your career to get where you are today? What, 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 what pieces of advice would you have for uh, someone that wants to become, you know, someone uh, uh, in an executive position just like you? Absolutely. I think it's a great question. And everybody's path is different, right? And some of it comes down to great timing, but it also comes down to hard work and dedication. So, you know, there's certainly a thing called luck. Um, luck will only carry you so far, but I think it's really deciding what is it that you want to do with your career and putting your mind to it. Um, I'm a firm believer in manifesting what it is. If there's something, if I have a goal in mind or something that I want to do, I'm going to put all of my positive thoughts and manifest that to try and make that happen. Um, and I have to put the work in behind it to also show that that's going to happen. One other thing I think it's really important that I always tell people is constantly be learning. Um, I am a voracious reader uh, prior to joining Western Wealth because I don't have as much time now in startup mode, but I used to read a book a week and I would vary what types of books I would read. Some of them would be fiction and just kind of um, no brainer type of reading to take my mind off of maybe a challenging situation or a challenging week that I was dealing with. And then I would have nonfiction that I would read, business books that I would read, whatever it may be, but to constantly grow and learn, it helps also grow your vocabulary. It just makes you, there's a lot more conversation that can come when you read. Uh, now that I've been at Western Wealth, I do still read some books, but not one a week. Uh, but I'm you know, constantly on LinkedIn and reading a lot of things about the industry and then other stuff that's outside of the industry to see how can I you know, make myself better? How can I bring those things into our organization and drive us and move us forward. Um, another thing I would say is, you know, find either a direct or an indirect mentor. Sometimes people get a little taken aback when you hear the word mentor and they don't know what that means. It's like, well, I'm not meeting regularly with somebody. Well, you can have an indirect mentor. They may not even know it. You know, you're really looking at their actions. You're listening to their words. You're seeing how they carry themselves. And it's something that you're emulating in your own life. 
Um, and it's also important then to have the differentiator of having a sponsor. So thinking about who's that person in your career that is going to be bringing up your name when you're not in the room. So when you're starting your career, you know, when I was a training coordinator or a training director, I wasn't in the executive room, uh, but I was fortunate enough to have a sponsor that took a chance on me. So I was somebody that had worked on site. They saw that I had a passion and drive for the industry and what I was doing and for helping people. And they put me in a training role. Gosh, I think it had only been maybe after six months that I had been in the industry and at at the company I was at and somebody took a chance on me and put me in this role and they then became my sponsor. Um, they also were a mentor, but I think there is a differentiator between a mentor and a sponsor. A mentor really is somebody that's, you know, providing guidance. That's really somebody, an outlet that you can bounce ideas off of. And a sponsor is somebody that really is your advocate and they're really helping to progress and move your career forward. And they're the ones that are in the room when you're not invited to the room to make sure that you're going to be um, tapped for that next opportunity. And so I was very fortunate in my career uh, to have a sponsor. And I think it also comes down to, you know, success in this industry is all about building relationships. It is so very important that you build relationships, not just within your own organization or your own department, but that you build relationships across the industry at competitor companies, with supplier partners, um, with your investors or your owners, that you're a trusted resource that when they have a problem or an issue or something that needs to be solved, they say, let's call Adrian or let's call Jennifer because I trust them and I know that they have the answer. Jennifer, one of the things that you mentioned is reading, you know, and reading a lot. Uh, would you like to share with the audience uh, some of your uh, most favorite books that you ever read, you know, fiction and nonfiction titles? Uh, I will, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll allow for you to do that. Absolutely. So something that I read every day, every year is called The Daily Stoic. Um, it's you read one, one page a day and it's a different passage. So each month has a different um a different category basically that they're going to focus on. And then each day has a message for that category that you're focusing on. And I've been reading that, gosh, I don't know, five, six, seven years now. And it always sits next to the nightstand um, next to my bed. So every morning when I wake up, I read my passage. And it's really interesting because anybody that has picked up the Daily Stoic or will pick it up is those messages often come to you just at the right time. Um, you don't realize how much you need to be reminded of a message. So even though I've read that book, you know, five, six, seven years over, you're constantly relearning. It's a validation of something you may have in the back of your mind, but you just don't know. And it's a good reminder on how to lead your day and how to um, encourage and influence other people. And then that same author, he writes a whole host of books, which I absolutely love. Um, the Obstacle is the Way, which is a great book. Um, ego is the enemy, um, stillness is the key, and courage is calling. So it really, all of those books really tie into the Stoic principles. But again, they're great reminders. They're great refreshers. I've read several of them multiple times over. And it depends on where you are in your life and what you're open to receive at that time uh, for what you will get out of that book or out of that passage. Um, from a fiction perspective, uh, one of my absolute favorite books is The City of Fallen Angels. Um, it's set in Venice, and it's the same author that wrote um, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, which is also a tremendous book. Um, so yeah, I mean, I could go on and on um, with books, but it's just something that as a child, I always enjoyed doing. I remember, you know, during the summer going to the library and picking up my books every week and uh, just digging into them. Company culture is uh, one of the subjects that I'm very passionate about. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you build a company, the culture comes with it. You build a culture, okay? Uh, I'd like to ask you, Jennifer, what, what are a few great things that, you know, happening at Western, uh, Western Wealth? And then why Western Wealth? For someone looking from outside in and, you know, someone that's looking for an opportunity, a, a career opportunity, why Western Wealth? You know, what, would, what makes your company, I think, different and what why do you think that western wealth could be the answer for someone looking from outside in yeah that's a great question so 
gosh, a couple different things. There's some exciting things that are happening is that we are still in startup mode. So like I mentioned, you know, building the plane while we're flying it, we onboarded 60 properties in two years. And we actually have a little bit of a slow time right now where we don't have as many acquisitions. And that's really our opportunity to go back and reevaluate all the process, procedure, and policy that we put in place over these past two years, make sure we tighten all of that up. And then it's really important too that you can't make those decisions in a vacuum, that you have to get the input and the feedback from your on-site teams, the people that make it happen, the ones that actually implement and execute what you're putting into place. So asking them their opinions and finding out what we can do to make the organization better. Uh, one of the ways we did that over this past six months is implementing an employee engagement platform uh, through Swift Bunny. And we are now able to completely listen to what our employees are thinking and feeling at various touch points without their time with us. So we've gone through our baseline survey. We've also completed our first quarter review. And we really take it seriously that we don't just want people to feel like they're taking a survey and then nothing happens, right? You take a survey, you feel like you gave all this great feedback and then you never get any follow-up. So we've been really dedicated to when we survey people and when we have these touch points that we go back and we really evaluate what our employees are saying and then make sure that we put an action plan together and communicate that action plan to our employees so they understand that we heard them, we're listening and we're making changes but we also do let them know that, you know, we're not going to be able to act on every single recommendation or piece of feedback that they give, but we have to look at the things that are either pervasive across, you know, the entire platform or things that we know that are really going to move the needle. Maybe it's things that we overlooked or just didn't think of at the time. So we definitely put those action plans together. We hold an all hands call with every single employee, and then we follow up in writing. So everybody knows what the plan is and they can hold us accountable to it. Um, you know, something else we've really been focused on is training and building up our platform. So like I mentioned, you know, throughout COVID, everything was being done on teams. Um, there would be some one-on-one -on -one training, but we're now getting to a point where I've got a team of three. Um, they're able to go to the properties. They're able to host meetings in the cities that we operate in and give people that one-on-one -on -one or group training to really move forward in their careers. Uh, the good thing I think with COVID that came out of it is it accelerated our technology adoption in this industry um, by light years. And I think it also, it really accelerated how we're going to look at training moving forward. So understanding that every learner learns in a little bit different way. You know, some people want to sit in a classroom for eight hours. Some people, the thought of that just, you know, gives them anxiety. So some people want to have, you know, just in time learning where they're able to look at a video for a particular task that they need to do. And within 90 seconds, they can get the information that they need. So we've really been able to branch out and offer multiple different ways for people to get the information that they need to be successful in their job. Um, either through job aids, through videos, and through in-person training um, or group training. You mentioned starting the company right when COVID hit. So we're talking about building something brand new from like scratch to about 15,000 units, you said, right? Yes. Okay. So you have COVID, you have labor shortages, you have the great resignation you have to build a company from zero to 15,000 units. You know, that takes quite a, you know, quite a few people to, to run that company, to, to service the residents, to oversee everything, operations. So how, how did you overcome all those obstacles? And uh, what are some pieces of uh, wisdom that you have to share with the audience or how your company overcame all these challenges, which are tremendous, they're still around. They're still around. Lo labor shortage, especially in maintenance, is it's, it's the biggest headache, the biggest uh, reason for all of us in the industry losing sleep. Absolutely. And it is, you know, it all comes down to, and I'll explain in detail because I think most people will give the same answer, but it does all come down to the people. I and mean, what I mean by that is hiring the right person to sit in the right seat and also setting the right expectations with employees. So what we found, you know, when you're, you're building a company from scratch, it's a startup. And the, 
the level of intensity in a startup is very different than a stabilized company. So when you're interviewing people, it's really important to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? And lay a really good foundation for what it is that you're looking for and what the expectations are going to be. Because I will say the startup environment is not an environment that's meant for every employee. So if you're hiring employees that are used to a very structured environment, that already has policies and procedures, already has systems and technology that's in place, it can be extremely disruptive for an employee to come in and have to roll up their sleeves and help build that. Um, so what we've really found is that has been a challenge and spending time um, on the front end, making sure that we're finding the right candidates that fit the environment for what we're looking for. Um, I know you've had Tavon on your show previously, and I always like to say that she's my secret weapon. So one of my very first hires when um, I joined Western Wealth and we were building the company is, you know, we knew as an organization, we wanted to be a people first organization. And if you say you're going to be people first, that means you have to put your money where your mouth is. And so if you're going to say you're people first, you've got to hire the right people to make sure that they're hiring the right people. And so Tavon was one of my very first hires. Uh, we hired recruiting before we hired HR. We hired recruiting before we hired, you know, a lot of other things. And we prioritized that because we knew if we wanted to grow from zero to 60 properties, um, that means there's a lot of people capital that needs to be involved in that. And so when people talk about, you know, asking me what I do, I actually don't say that I, I run a property management company. Um, that's one piece of what I do, uh, but I run a staffing agency and I run a technology company uh, because that I think is how we really differentiate ourselves is that we now have a team, um, like I said, I have 15,000 units, but we have a team of four in recruiting because we have constant um, acquisitions that are coming in. We're constantly hiring new employees. And then as you mentioned with the great resignation and, and labor shortages, you know, there's been a little bit more turn than there had been previously in our industry. And so our recruiting team is constantly staying focused and staying busy. Uh, but they do a fantastic job of taking something that can be extremely time consuming and really the most important task that we have for our on-site teams and take that out of their hands and do all of the pre-screening, do all of the vetting, and then provide just the top candidates for the hiring manager to meet with to make the best decision for their property. So that really has been something I think that has set us apart and making sure that what you're saying on your website or what you're saying on your social media actually falls in place with the actions that you're taking. So people, you know, the people that work for you say, you know what, what they told me was going to happen and what they told me the company stands for actually is happening. And we've been able to see that because many of our employees are posting their experience on social media and tagging us. And we're not asking them to do that. It's because they've bought into the mission, the vision, and the culture, which I think, Adrian, I never really answered your culture question, so I'll dig into that a little bit too. But, you know, employees need to understand what's expected of them so then they can really give their best when they come to work. And from a culture perspective, you know, when you're building a brand new company, um, there's a lot of people that will say different things about culture. I am a firm believer that I certainly, you know, set the tone as the leader of the organization, but I am not the full driver of the culture of this organization. I can provide an environment where the culture can grow and flourish and expand, but it has to come from all levels of the organization. And every single employee is the one that's building the culture of what Western Wealth Communities is. And I never take that for granted. So that's why we did implement, you know, the employee engagement platform so we can hear what our employees are saying and take swift action. Um, and we have a couple of what we call our hashtag culture. So we have four different hashtags um, and I'll quickly go through those. But it really embodies, and for anybody that follows us on LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram, you may see a lot of our hashtags and you probably wonder what they mean. Uh, the first one is BSU, which I'll say the polite version of that, which is blow stuff up. Um, it's basically that we like to do things differently just because every other company that people in our organization have worked for do it that way 
doesn't mean that we need to do it that way. Let's look at things differently from a different lens. Uh, we also have one WGYB, which is we've got your back. Um, and that is that we've got each other's back through thick and thin. You know, that was most important during COVID when so many people were sick, um, either within our organization or their families, and we needed to take care of each other. And with that, we host um, a We've Got Your Back event every year where we give backpacks out to every single child uh, that lives at our communities prior to the school season starting. Um, two others are uh, WDW, which is We Don't Wait, uh, meaning we don't wait for somebody to tell us what to do. We take the initiative and we get it done. And then last but not least is TMV, which is uh, That's My Village. So our CEO was accepting an award um, for Entrepreneur of the Year. And in her speech, she had people in the audience and she said, you know, this award is not for me, it's for my village. And so that's where That's My Village came about because no one person um, can make a company run or make a company company succeed. It is the village that makes the company run. And if one of us succeeds, all of us succeed. And if one of us fails, all of us fail together. One of the things I'm really passionate about, and this is where my uh, original background is, well, my current one too, right? Uh, management, uh, maintenance management. So we as an industry, if we are to be very honest, uh, very genuine about what's happening, our service personnel, our service managers, or maintenance managers, they're lacking the management, the financial part training in industry in general. Some companies are doing a better job than others. You know, let's be honest about that too. Let's just be specific. But overall, as an industry, I think that you know we're kind of behind on that. Uh, do, do you do you agree with the statement? I yeah. absolutely do. Yes. Okay. So I, I want to hear from you know from you, Jennifer. What would be some things that we could do to address to improve the situation? If you if you have some thoughts on this, absolutely. I think it's so important to, you know, oftentimes when people are going to the properties, they go directly to the property manager, and that's where a lot of the focus takes place. And it's so important when you go on property, when I go on property, to spend time with every single person because you get a different perspective and you hear different things of what's happening well and what's not happening so well. Um, I would say from a maintenance team perspective, it's really important to under, for them to understand the why of what they do. What is it that they're bringing to the table? What impact do they make? positively or negatively in some cases, so they do understand how important their role is. So if something with maintenance isn't going well, that's a trickle down effect, right? It can impact ratings and reviews. It can impact renewals. It can impact everything. It can impact the value of the property and what the, what the property can actually trade for when it's being sold. And so you can never undermine that. Um, one thing that we really try to, try to instill in our teams is understanding the value of a dollar. So for instance, you know, depending on what cap rate you're looking at, but if you've got a dollar worth of value that you're adding to the property, I'm sorry, a dollar of expenses that you're saving or a dollar of income that you're generating, that can sometimes equal $250 worth of value. And so when you start thinking about an improvement that maintenance does to save money at the property, it's not gonna be a dollar, it's gonna be maybe thousands of dollars. And when you times that by 250, the value that you're creating at that property from a maintenance technician or a maintenance supervisor, their impact is enormous. And it's so important for them to understand that impact. And when they're making decisions, when they understand the why is when it really clicks in. And I think it's so important that the property manager and the maintenance supervisor need to be in lockstep, right? They need to be huddling every morning and really strategizing about the property, about what needs to take place and making sure that the maintenance supervisor understands the budget and understands what spend they have authority to make and what they need to collaborate with the manager on because it really does impact you know, the property's performance. Without the why, in general, you would never get a buy-in. Right. If you tell someone you have to do this, but you don't put any type of reason behind it of why they should do it, mm -hmm. how are you going to get a buy-in? Right. It like, just won't happen. People might do it because 
okay, it's the job because they might feel like I'm losing my job if I'm not doing it. But if you put reason behind it and you actually make them understand why, you're going to have them as a partner along the way. Mm-hmm. They get, they're going to feel like this is, I'm part of something that's bigger, bigger than myself, right? This mission, this thing. And I understand what that is because a lot of times, you know, we might be telling them, hey, you know, this is a big project, whatever, but then we don't really detail. So then the buy-in doesn't, you know, doesn't get, so I, I love the white part. I, yeah. I, I just think it's so important that we get this part to, you know, to get them to buy in and also to make them feel like they're part of something. They're not just the, you know, just somebody working at the property. They're part, they're a very important part of the whole team. And then it's very, uh, it's up to them. Like the way they perform is going to dictate how successful this deal is, this business is that we're running. Without them performing at a you know at the highest level, then the property, the business is not going to turn in the biggest you know profit possible. Right. So I, I truly love that. Um, one thing that I, I wanted to ask you, Jennifer, you know, we all talk about you know successful stories like yours. It, it's, it's just an amazing you know thing how many things you have accomplished throughout your career. But then w- what we typically don't talk about uh, in society in general is failure. Right? Mm-hmm. How, how how did we get this? This is not a linear trajectory. It's not like an arrow shooting. You know, you start from here and everything's like this. It's yeah. more like up <laughs> and down. And sometimes you hit the rock bottom. So that it's it's very important to bring in failure and failures and what we learn from the failures. What were the lessons? So uh, my my next question to you is: uh, How did a failure work? apparent failure set you up for future success? Yeah, that's a great question. In your life. So, you know, I certainly make mistakes every day, right? There's little things that, you know, happen and then there's bigger things that happen. Um, but one thing that I do say is if you've ever watched uh, the series, uh, Ted Lasso, I love his mentality with his team about the goldfish. So, you know, the goldfish has, I think, less than 10 seconds of a memory as it relates to failures. So what I always like to say when it comes to failure is you have to acknowledge the failure. Um, I'm, I like to say I'm my worst critic, right? I will overanalyze what happened, nitpick everything that went down. Uh, but then I quickly self-reflect and figure out what, what could I have done better in this situation Who could I have involved in the situation so it wouldn't have happened? And then how can I forgive myself and move on, right? So create an action plan. So we had a a situation that came up this week, a couple of people on my team that was extremely stressful, um, and we weren't quite sure how we were going to get out of it. And uh, we came together as a team and started brainstorming on things. Uh, and then worked with a partner that we had been working with. And we came up with a solution that worked for everybody. We documented it. Then we started evaluating, okay, let's do our debrief of the situation and how can we ensure that it doesn't happen again? So what what things are we gonna put in place to make sure that we learned from the mistake that we made and then move forward in our process to document so it won't happen again. And then once we've done that, and done that successfully, we need to let it go and be the goldfish and not think about it and keep bringing it up. You know, it's like when you're a child and your mom or dad brings up something that happened, you know, two months ago that you were scolded on or a a friend or a spouse that brings up a situation that happened months ago. Nobody wants to be reminded of that. So it is important that you can't brush it under the rug and just act like it didn't happen. You do need to self-reflect you need to talk through with yourself what happened and how you can avoid it moving forward, come up with a plan and a procedure so it won't happen again. And then you have to forgive yourself and, and let it go. I love every single word of what you just said. You know, use them as learning experiences, mm-hmm. find accountability piece, find a solution, move on, forget about it, put it behind. It, it, it's, it's history. Yeah. I love it. absolutely love it. And it's so important too, you know, I think there's a a good topic there too, is really thinking about, 
getting out of your comfort zone, right? So in my career, you know, I've gone through different paths where I was on site and then got into corporate roles with training and I took on marketing and I took on revenue management. And now I'm, I'm overseeing a management company. You know, I was telling um, a group of my employees just before, before the show that there's so many days I sit in my office and I'm like, wow, I've never encountered this before. Um, I'm out of my comfort zone, but I'm going to roll up my sleeves and figure it out. And I'm not just going to do it on my own. We have this tremendous, our industry has a network of people that are so smart and are so willing to help anybody that I can send a text or pick up the phone and phone a friend and say, hey, I'm dealing with this situation. Do you have something that could help me with this? Or can we just bounce some ideas? And I think everybody that's new in our industry, or even if you're seasoned in the industry and haven't taken advantage of it, that's really been the key to my success is the relationships that I've built and the network that I have, because it truly does take a village to be successful. And no one person can know everything and know how to handle situations gracefully. Uh, we need each other to get through that and constantly use that network because if you allow people to utilize you for things, they will give it back to you tenfold. Now, sometimes it's not the same person. You, right. you just help someone and it's kind of like karma, right? Good things come back to you. If you do good, good things come back to you. It, it's not a transactional type of thing. Mm -hmm. The networking is, it's, I think, where most people fail because they fail to understand, you know, what networking is, is about. Uh, as you could, you know, as you probably know, I'm, I'm extremely, I'm huge on networking. Uh, I, I do this. It, it's kind of like a, a job in itself for me. Every single hour that I have outside of work and, you know, my family, I, I spend on networking. I, I just, uh, I just think that there's a lot, a lot of value. And I don't do it again in a transactional way. Like I'm gonna help you if you're gonna help me or you owe me down the road. It never right. is that way. But you know what? The, the way it happens, like I'm so blessed with you know so many things that are coming, good that are coming mm -hmm. back at me. And I think they're they're coming at me because I must have done something good to somebody. That's I must right. have helped someone. So it, it, it's it's a pretty amazing thing. It is. Jennifer, I wanted to ask you if you were to uh, offer a few pieces of advice for someone young that's ready to start, you know, to, to go into the real life, you know, they just finished high school or they just finished college, you know, they never really had a, you know, a real job in their life or, you know, maybe they were part time during the, during the school, but they're facing real life. What, what are uh, a few pieces of advice that you, you would like to share with them or to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to tell them? Absolutely. I think, you know, I'm, I'm so glad you're asking this question. So one of the things that I'm extremely passionate about is the opportunity that I had to study abroad um, on two occasions. So in my undergraduate, as well as my graduate degree, and to me, you grow by leaps and bounds. So when you're taken out of your comfort zone of either living at home with your parents or living at your university, whatever it may be, and you're put into a new environment, where they speak a different language, where the currency is different. Um, at the time when I went and lived in France, um, I didn't have a credit card. Now, it also wasn't as mainstream at the time because this was, I'm not going to tell you how many years ago, but it was quite a long time ago. Um, I had my first credit card and I had to learn to budget my money and I had to be responsible for myself and really show discipline and responsibility. So any young person that I ever have a chance to interface with and they want to ask my advice, I recommend that they do some form of study abroad, be it either sometimes in high school, if you're taking a language, you can do it in college and graduate school, because being exposed to other cultures and to other ways of life, I think also opens your mind, you're less judgmental of other people. Um, you're more, you embrace other cultures more and you learn more things about yourself and other people. Um, I also learned that, you know, speaking other languages that I learned more about speaking English by taking a foreign language than I did by going to school and taking English classes. Um, so you just learn a lot about yourself. Um, and you also, you know, when you're, you're moving away from your family and you're kind of out on your own, you have to build relationships, you have to meet new people, and you have to learn how to function um, without the, the cushion of having your family or your friends that you've known for a long time. So that's one of the biggest pieces of advice. Um, also, just going back to our earlier conversation around learning, 
uh, just because you finished high school and you think school's done or just because you finished college, um, you should constantly be learning until the day you die. You should try and learn something new um, every single day. And somebody that I worked with several years ago, um, he always left, he left something with me that was very, um, very inspiring to me. So I was working for a third party management company at the time. And his advice to me was anytime you go into a client meeting, you should always leave the client with something that they didn't know prior to the meeting. You should always educate them. You're not, even if you're never going to get the management contract, you should go in and be a partner and educate and allow them to learn from you or from your company. Um, just leave them with some nugget of wisdom that when you walk out the door, they said that meeting was worth my time because I learned something from that interaction. And I think that was a really valuable piece of advice. And it was something that I always took um, when I was working for third party management companies and we were pitching business that I looked at that approach, not as a sales process, but as an education process and a way to really build a relationship and build trust with a client in hopes that when you build that trust, that that then turns into the sale. Excellent. That's excellent advice. Adding value. Yeah. You're providing adding value. value. Like, hey, why was I in this meeting for 15, 30, <laughs> 45 minutes? I came out of the meeting with something I didn't know before. That, that's, that, that's, that's amazing. That's, that's an amazing, very powerful piece of advice. Um, Jennifer, we're, uh, we're kind of approaching uh, the end of our conversation. Unfortunately, you know, time is not on our side, but I, I really like to uh, fire a couple more questions of you, uh, at you really quick. Uh, they're really important. They're questions that uh, they're not really brought up too much uh, in conversations like this in public conversations. Uh, the first one would be when you, you know, when you have a situation that you lose focus, you feel overwhelmed, how do you, uh, what type of resources do you use? How do you get back on track? Yep, absolutely. A couple different things. So um, I am a firm believer in meditation. So I meditate um, every morning when I wake up and every evening before I go to bed. But if I've had a situation that's, you know, increased my, my blood pressure or has been a really stressful situation, um, I will do like a 10 minute meditation to try and get my thoughts onto something else. Um, so then I can get refocused and back on track. And another thing that I think is extremely important is getting up and taking a walk. Um, even if you're taking a call and you're on a walk, getting fresh air always helps. And then a phone a friend, um, phone my husband or phone a friend and ask them to tell you a joke. Just, you know, when you can laugh, it alleviates the stress of what's happening and it really allows you to refocus and get back on track. So those are three things I would say that I do um, pretty regularly. Jennifer, in the last, in the past three to five years, uh, could you think of a new belief or behavior or habit that you, uh, that you improved them, uh, that you you brought into your life, into your routine, that helped you improve the most uh, in this time period? Yeah, I would say, so one of them, it's been over five years, but um, I brought yoga into my life probably, gosh, nine or 10 years ago. And I have a religious practice um, of doing yoga. Uh, when I get into a little blip where I'm not doing it as much, uh, my body and my mind feel it. Um, so that has really, you know, whenever anybody asks me about yoga, it has been life changing. Um, and then the other thing that's probably five, five or so years ago is the meditation practice. So, you know, reading the daily stoic, um, I get emails um, from the daily stoic every day as well. And just meditating every morning and every night before going to bed and really resetting your mind and, you know, being thankful for what you have. Uh, one of my yoga instructors always says this, and I love it. She says, be thankful for everything you have and be thankful for everything that you don't have. And sometimes I think that's really hard for people to grasp, you know, being thankful for what you don't have. Um, but it, it really sits with me and it resonates with me because you don't know what comes with those things that you don't have. Yeah. You don't know the strings attached. That's right. Everything there's, there's, there's a counterweight out there for sure yeah that's that's quite excellent mm -hmm. <clears throat> jennifer thank you so much for coming uh for coming uh, to the show uh, it, it was a real pleasure i really enjoy our conversation 
I'd like to give you the opportunity in closing to say something that maybe uh, you you wish I would have uh, I would have brought up you know a, a subject a topic something you're passionate about just anything that you know you like to share with the audience in closing. Sure. I think one thing I would love to add is I did briefly talk about our We've Got Your Back campaign where we give um, stocked backpacks to all of our children. Uh, but another thing that's really part of the culture of our organization and also something that um, is extremely important to me with the way that I was raised is giving back to the communities uh, that we live and work in. And so at our organization, we do uh, very regular community service events. Uh, tomorrow, we're actually heading to St. Vincent de Paul to make pizzas for homeless people um, and give them out. And, you know, we also do another event called Rent Free Christmas, where each, each of our communities, uh, we give out free December rent to one family or resident. And then we also collect those stories of the people that are nominated. And we give out what we call the full Christmas experience to you know, up to 20, 20 different families across our portfolio to really change their life um, and give them and maybe their children or their families an experience that they wouldn't have been able to have otherwise. So you know, what I can leave with is that sometimes we get more out of it than even the people we're serving. And it's really important on all of us to take the time. We are very, very fortunate uh, for what we have, and it's our duty to give it back um, to the people that are in our communities. Couldn't think of a better way to close this. <clears throat> Jennifer, thank you again so much for coming uh, for coming over, for coming on the show. Uh, I truly appreciate. I hope to have you back here soon to share more about you know the great things that happen at uh, Western Wealth. Uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for coming, everybody. Thank you very much for watching. This is uh, Multifamily Chronicles, and I'm your host, Adrian Danila. This was episode number 24. I hope to see you back here soon. Have a great day.